All right. Are we live now? Yep, we are live. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone, to hi, whoever man. who's watching. Hi. Say hi to the Facebook community. Hi, <laughs> hi <everybody>. Facebook community. <laughs> Hello. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey guys. My name, is, yeah, my name is Nabila, and I'm the uh, Community Development Officer of Econite. But uh, right now, you know, it's Malam Malam Simbang Alam ataupun Simbang Malam Simpoi style. So I won't be known as the CD Officer. Just call me an owl because I stay up late night. And joining here with us today with Yasmin, with Amle, and also Fadli. Right, so for yes. those of you Hello. who didn't see our previous, <laughs> for those of you who didn't see our previous post, oh, someone say hi, hi Sam, <laughs> Sam Bakda. <laughs> so hello Fadi and hello Yasmin. All right, there we go. We've got this. Hi, okay. Jan. Right. So to those of you who are not sure, you know what's happening and all this stuff. Okay, a bit of background about Simbang Alami, Spanya, Bendeni. This idea just popped up into our mind this morning. Tiba tiba, you know. Fadli or Yasmin say, hey, don't kita buat satu session malam ni kerja sembang ke? After all, we haven't met each other for quite a while, I think, since MCO and everything. And uh, so tonight, I jadi anak murid pada tiga orang sifu ni. They will actually walk down the memory lane about their journey in sustainability. And I sebagai anak murid akan mendengar dengan penuh perasaan uh, emosi cewa. Yep. All right. So, um... Okay, let's start with, let's start a bit. Uh, all right, to three of you, actually, you know, uh, being the one of the younger people in the team, kind, we've always been curious about uh, how did, how did it started for you, the journey in sustainability in environment? Maybe you can start dengan Amle. Okay, uh, hi guys. I, I would like to start I think maybe uh, with my involvement with WWF at that time, sustainability is was a very alien word for me. At that time, environmental uh, or you can say conservation was about biodiversity. It focused a lot on on that issue. And in fact, even when I joined WWF, I was totally. Uh, interested in doing some wildlife work it's about wildlife it's about tigers elephants and, and uh, the, the the endangered species especially the big mammals and also I think uh, other species like turtles and whatnot even though sustainable development was was initiated or the concept was already there since the 70s but it was not a very popular uh, idea at that time people were more interested when they talk about environment they were more interested in uh in the animals uh, but it was the transition stage it was a transition between a focus on biodiversity and also going towards the larger picture of conservation and that's why in 1992 not only that we have uh this very big publicity on what is real conservation, i.e. sustainable development. The name for World Wildlife Fund was also changed to fit into the situation. It became the Worldwide Fund for Nature. But the word nature was, is still there. And until now, it's still there because it still have this idea of protecting nature. At that time, there were a lot of zoologists more. There was, I mean, in the early 1990s, there were no experts on water quality or let alone air quality. It was all about uh, flora and fauna. But my involvement in WWF, I was lucky that when I got involved in WWF, I had a very good Sifu. I like to mention his name, who is Lee Kapjib. He brought me into the new idea of conservation, which is about people's empowerment to make changes to their lifestyles so that we will achieve sustainable development. Now, why do we put people into the picture? At that point, 
a lot of uh, what you call environmentalism was from the point of view of the so-called techno technocrats of conservation the scientists the zoologists i'm i'm by 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 training i'm a zoologist and that's why i joined wwf and this that is about i mean i was interested in environments because of uh, biodiversity because i love animals but then in the early part of 1990s the focus changed to people's empowerment trying to make people understand more about environment so that they can make their own decisions and that was the focus of uh that was my focus at that time and that's the reason why i joined the education department i believe the education is the process or the key uh, factor which can enable people to achieve sustainable development my point of view is that sustainable development can only be achieved if the people are aware of the problems and they have the skills and the knowledge to make their own decision and also to to have the options and and the 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 understanding of uh my understanding of sustainable development is that in order for you to achieve sustainable development you have to give the right knowledge to the people and the options and let the people make their own decision so that's why we come up with some projects like project penchala which is a river project which is the first water based project for wwf and i would like to say the first urban river project in malaysia and we are glad that we started that uh, and also it involved the community okay and then we had kenong project uh, which is uh, uh, should i call rural development project okay at that time uh, a lot of these community projects were referred to as the icdp or the if i'm not mistaken it meant it stands for integrated community development project so that was the idea people will start people started to think that the, the transition is that community is going to make the decision for to achieve sustainable development and one of the um, main slogans at that time was think globally act locally i'm not sure whether the present generation ever ever heard about this slogan but at that time in the 1990s people were talking about that everywhere people were talking about doing things at their uh, at their level to achieve a global or uh, a sustainable development at the global level so uh, from that point on we started to move the, the the what you call the activism or environmentalism has grown into a new concept and it's about people's empowerment but you still can see some people or would i call them the technocentric people who are still not in uh, still not uh used or are still opposing to some extent this idea because they believe that the people at the top or the technos technocrats should decide what happened on the ground which i'm against uh too uh i believe that ngos or environmental groups should act as facilitators give the information to the people or facilitate the process of getting information to the people sharing this to the people at the communities uh get all the government sectors the academicians and everybody who are interested and then let the people make the decision for me sustainability is about informed decision making by the local communities i think that should be good enough <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but that's like that's like a lot because i you know you can see that uh you know the work involving community actually started since long time ago and it's actually very essential whenever we do 
all these sustainability and environmental efforts. So I'm gonna I've got a few questions about that and I will but before I ask those questions, maybe we can move to uh, Yasmin. Would you like to share like, how it started for you in sustainability? Um I resonate what Amle says. Um when I started I not heard of the word sustainability. I know what it means, but it wasn't applied very commonly within an environmental context. That's sustainable development, right? 1992, I think, Kyoto Protocol. I mean, that's, my, that's my year. That's when they, yeah, that's when you were born? Yeah. Maybe. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah. That's uh, that was the beginning, I think, the Kyoto Protocol, and I think it took a while um, for the re respective global organizations to spread the word. But I think at the same time, in 1992, local agenda appeared or surfaced in Malaysia as well, KL. Yeah. Um, so you can see, but we we were progressing, um, but. Uh, we were still talking really much on what Amle rightly said, nature conservation, biodiversity, forest conservation, uh, protect, protecting water sources, a little bit of indigenous rights, I think. Indigenous rights probably started much earlier in the 70s and 80s. Um, but I was fortunate and I, I started my stepping stone in WWF like Amle as well. In fact, Amle was my boss in 1998. I was a fresh graduate. Uh, fresh from Duke, uh, came back and I remember being very hardcore on conservation. It was all about protect, protect, protect. I, I was thought that maybe an organization or like an NGO can brave that front in that protection. And then I met Amle, who was in the education department, but I learned about community involvement, community participation. I think he brought me to Kanong Forest in one of our um, forest medicinal plant taxonomy project. Uh, and I saw for the first time, like I've got this wealth of knowledge, so to speak, and on my shoulder coming back to Malaysia, all gung-ho about I'm, I'm going to do something, I'm going to be someone and try to do something for the environment only to be you know distilled down to like you really know a lot from books but really not what what is in your local context and that was one of the really critical realization point and i saw how amle maneuver his ways from uh, the te tarit seller at the food court in kuala Lipis to the boatman to the orang orang asal that brought us around um and had to live with bare basics. And I realized, damn, that there's a lot more than just having education and knowledge about environment. You really got to be on the ground with the people, understanding the issues from all perspectives. Uh, and then I grew up a little bit and thought I, got, I had really strong interest in um, toxic pollution toxic chemical pollution, specifically um, chemicals that we use daily in our lives that actually disrupt our reproductive system. So I went on to study, my, I got a master's in that. And then I realized a conservation or environmental work shouldn't reduce me to being in the lab. I was in the lab a lot and I felt a bit claustrophobic, just stuck in the lab. I mean, I, I appreciate the experience I totally respect people who love being in the lab. Hats off to you, but it didn't really suit me as a soul. You know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that for the rest of my life. Um, and then I branched out. I branched out. I did, I did a lot of. I was like, like a camp biologist, a freelance here and there, um, until 2005 when Econites was born, and by that time I was just doing a lot of educational work. And my focus was really on young children because my kids were young then. And the rest is pretty much history. And I think during that time, I heard more about sustainability. Um, I think the concept, the holy trinity of sustainable development came into play. You know, you're balancing social, economic, environmental needs. 
but along the way, I think, as Amle said, the technocrats, uh, while the technocrats had certain way of dealing with things, I, I, I felt that great partnerships would be able to break that barrier between how the technocrats operate and how we operate. Um, and, and I just grew into that mold where I always saw I always saw all stakeholders' environment as a positive way. Uh, the idea was how through a vehicle like Econites, we can harness the best of these organizations and work for the interests of the community. And uh, subsequently, my passion in community development grew, and I studied that as well. So then my, PhD, my PhD is in sustainability science with a focus on sustainable community development. So along the way, I think my brain capacity for knowledge or my thirst for knowledge evolved along with my interest in this sector. And um, I've seen quite a big difference. I think, I think kid, not kids your age, naps, but uh, <laughs> youth your age. <laughs> um, luckily, I'm not the oldest in this session. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I think your generation is very privileged um, to have access to more things than we did when we studied it. And I feel you guys are more privileged because you guys are multi-potentials. I see you guys always having more than just one interest area. Masa, I don't know, Amli, Masti, bila you graduate, you nak jadi zoologist, you can't. Yep. And I'm like, I'm going to be a biologist. But you, I came back 1998, it's like, the orang not hire a biologist. That the orang needs that skill set. And I was like, then why was I sent to go study that? When I come back and no one was interested about environment. Yeah. Late 90s. Lakan. So, mm. I got kecewa. But then again, you know, I'm glad we managed to carve a niche through Econites. And through this niche, I also realized like talents like you guys, NAPS, you guys come from um, a school of thought or a value system which, um, you know, really actually empowers you to be more outspoken, to use technology more boldly, to use technology more creatively, uh, and then to apply it. So I'm, I'm proud to see a young generation today doing a lot more than we did, but you also had the right tools. You have social media, you spread your message faster. So imagine what can happen next if you can put the, some of the best of minds, young and old, together and uh, create something that's really good for the planet. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think, well, despite, well, regardless of the age, I feel that passion and determination brings everyone together. Yeah. But I agree that. Uh, I feel that my generation and also the younger generation, I need to kind of the younger generation had. I think we're blessed with a lot of things. Even like now with the CMCO or even MCO quarantine in other countries, we still have the access to all this material, uh, all this digital convenience that help us to run our uh, test, research, do community engagement as well. Mm. Compared to last time, but I feel like last time mungkin lagi short kot. <laughs> last time I rasa lagi rugged lah kan, Amli. Yeah, alright. Yeah. So rugged. um, Fali Fali is now Fali can't. He's having some uh this one some connection uh, setback, but it's okay. We can still move on without it. Nanti dia akan appear online again. Uh, <laughs> maybe this this is gonna be a personal uh question for both you and Amli. Uh, I know I know both of you met each other back in 1998. Uh, that time, Andre was the was your boss. But maybe we can ask, what was your first impression of each other? Simple, is it? Oh my God! Bulingan. Andre, is this public or not? <laughs> it is. Watch what you say. So, kena lama. So, kena, kena, uh, I mean, I mean, kita dalam bulan raya, still boleh maaf Zahir Bati lepas ni. But, you know, what was your first impression? And how did the both of you, because I see both of you as great, great figures in environment and sustainability, right? 
you know, how do you both empower each other and work together that time? Okay. Okay. Uh, I was told by the management that there there was a new student. Uh, there was a new a, a grad, a fresh grad coming to WWF, and they asked me whether I wanna uh, uh, wanna uh, involve her in my project in Kenong project because Kenong project was relatively a big and complicated project. It involves uh, not just biodiversity but talking to the people with various kind of attitudes and government officers, especially the department or the office or the forestry office. So I said, yeah, sure. And when I met Yasmin, I uh, I, I had mixed feelings because I'm not sure, I wasn't sure whether she can assist me or would she be uh, a committed person? Can she join me into the forest? Because when I, when I look at her, she was like, you know, that kind of urban American grad student. I said, I'm not sure whether she can, but I told myself, I'm going to torture her into bringing bring to the forest. If, if she is really committed, then she would. The reason I'm not on video right now is because you don't want to see my expression. But <laughs> So... To cut the short story short, she, I, I'm, I was quite amazed at her ability and her passion and her involvement, and, and, uh, if you know Yasmin at that time, you wouldn't be surprised that she had managed to establish an NGO like Econize. I can see that commitment and that passion from that point on. The way she works. I, I asked her to do every, uh, a lot of things and she did every <laughs> single thing that I asked her to do in the forest without electricity and very with very limited water supply and very difficult situation. Okay, we don't have electricity and whatnot, but uh, she did the job very well. So I believe that WWF was lucky to have somebody like her and of course it could nice should be should feel very lucky to have somebody like her as boss and i think that's why i can stay in eco nights for believe it or not for how many years since it started 15 years yeah, yeah. That's a long time for me because when i told people that i was in wwf for about 10 years i said it's a long time but now i'm in eco nights for 15 years and I don't even realize it, you see. And Eco Nights also, and I, I can, I think I can uh, sync with Eco Nights because uh, the concept, the philosophy, tallies with mine. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of. Just, uh, Okay, Yasmin, your your turn. Dah nampak, nampak air mata dah macam, oh, back then. Ui, oh, mafia dah masuk, weh, bos besar. Hi, <laughs> Fadli. Hi, Fadli. We're, we're talking Hello, about... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. We're reminiscing. Okay, I switched um, from computer to... Phone. To phone because I think maybe yeah. phone uses less power or whatever they're trying to play trick on me tonight. Yeah. <laughs> but I have my turtle with me. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm gonna give my version of it as uh, as well. But what was the question again, Abs? <laughs> Your first impression on Amli when you first met him in 1998, I was six years old back My then. first impression, my first thing in my mind was don't get myself fired. <laughs> and I knew, I knew he was going to test me because I'm this young American graduate uh, <laughs> with probably an accent, still got that accent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I took I took a lot of uh, learning experiences from him. Um, and for me, Amle was a rebel back then because 
his idea of community empowerment and inclusion of community into conservation work was not well, not what were not popular, not mainstream. Uh, mm. Conservation was left to the job of conservationist. They know best what is for the tigers. To I don't care about the people that live around them. I, that's what I got. And and Amli taught me no, you know, if we people are not included in the equation for conservation, then what voice do the animals wildlife have? Um, so it's it's important to get community involved and get community empowered to take that right decision so that they can within a local context be uh, living, you know, oh, this sounds so cliche, but living in harmony um, and not eating into the boundaries of wildlife. And there are some amazing successful case studies like this in the world as well. It's just that you can't separate the human connection that's needed for sustainable development work. Yeah. So that's yeah. my first impression of him. Wow. Now maybe that's... we can find out what's Fadli's impression of us. Oh, oh wait, Omar, oh, Fadi, how do you start in this journey of sustainability? Huh? You done miss out many hours, why did you? <laughs> Can hear you, Fadi. I'm just staring at three of you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you miss us that much, Shiva? <laughs> into our eyes and tell us yeah. the truth. Yeah, Fadi. <laughs> oh, man. You're missing a cigar, dude. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> cigar. I guess, I guess, not, I, I guess, I, I'm, I, I'm still, I mean, I, I realize uh my life motto uh, i think about a month ago I, I sort of like had this uh moment of brilliance or just this like you know inspiring moment and my life motto is still figuring out <laughs> so if you ask me the question about how i started I'm, I, I i'm still figuring out i i really didn't know how i got into this <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, because this is really personal and and deep, right? And honest. So really, I didn't know. Uh, I was, I, I was working for another company at that uh, in two thousand and eight. Um, so I basically, so how how my life basically is like a turning point of my life, um, from university life to. Uh, in between jobs and then some in 2006 i got into a very terrible accident and i was warded um, in the hospital for a week and i had a very bad uh, traumatic experience and it took me about a year to uh, no it, it took me one year of not doing anything recovering and not doing anything and uh, in 2008 i was looking for a job and i worked for um my cousin uh, i i not i work for my cousin I, I i went to him because i didn't have anything right i i didn't have a job experience i did i didn't finish my study for your information i didn't complete my degree i i was kicked out because i was doing outside activities more than you know being in the university so technically at that point of life was very very a low point of my life uh, so I, uh, I went to my cousin and literally I begged for a job, you know, to be a janitor. That's what I did. I said, just give me anything, lah, sapu sampah ke office ke, cuci toilet ke, I don't mind, like, as long as I can. Yeah, really, I mean, swear to God, uh, that's what I asked. I said, as long as I can do anything, because I really thought I, I didn't, I didn't have anything to offer, you know, like, I was probably at my lowest point of life. So I somehow got a job uh, and to do a bit of business development, like learning how to sort of do business lah and what proposal lah, blah, blah, which I, which I really bad at. But uh, a lot, yeah. So when I was doing that, um, I met Yasmin. I mean, I've I've met Yasmin before that, but I met her officially like in like an office setting and. She was actually started the first class in 2008. So she wanted some 
uh, volunteers kan untuk tolong hantar distribute uh, flyers tau to university to invite you know people to attend the festival i thought that was a great idea for two main reason eh? <laughs> one is that i can go out of the office <laughs> so i don't have to stay in the office and do that actual job i was like ah boleh keluar office so tak payah buat kerja kan boleh ponteng ah macam tu ah and secondly you know i was early 20s right and i thought like going to university you know i didn't have girlfriend that time i was like eh hey, maybe boleh borak dengan some girls in the college kan and just like get their phone number ke apa ke that was really <laughs> how i started <laughs> that was how i started to be to be absolutely frank with all of you you know i thought I, I, but but actually i, I just knew wanted that all to the build... while <laughs> <laughs> but really what i when when i realized what i was doing is that i i needed the confidence i was really like i said at the lowest point of my life you know i was uh, physically not fit mentally not fit and and i had nothing to offer so i thought going out and force myself to talk to people try to integrate back in the society because i've been on isolation for like almost a year right mm. so uh, that sort of gave me that 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 step back to you know to be back in society and i kind of like it uh and i think to cut a little bit short uh, during the clef festival one of my tasks was uh to organize the uh, uh the 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 acoustic session the music the green vibes green vibes Ooh, the, yeah. the green vibes yeah so uh, i think the <laughs> highlight was i i managed to get about 20 performances including zrv stone bay couple uh, one buck shot um you know mia palencia you know the uh, some at that point was yeah. like all this uh quite big indie um performances and musicians i even almost got yuna but uh, i think she asked she asked how much we can oh, pay and yuna i said i don't have money to pay yeah 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 she was she was already in university so i couldn't get her and i did all that uh free of charge i managed to get 20 performances for free of charge so I, i remember yasmin after the postmortem yasmin came i mean yasmin had all this postmortem with the committee team right and then she was like hey uh, this person you know this should have been done this should have been done you know like postmortem lah you tell what what went wrong what could be improved and i do remember this yasmin and you look at me in your house and you say fadli and i was like ready for a, a, a lash again macam ni mesti kena tahu kau ni kan because it was first first time you know i i, did, I, I had no experience and she looked at me and say good job i was like okay that was different because i was really expecting to get a beating lah i mean to be frank kan because like i know i would i would definitely do something really really bad or wrong or whatever that is not up to the committee's expectation so i think that's i think that was like kind of like a a, a, a revelation you know Yeah, like you know, for someone to you know, after a while, because you have to understand, after a while, you didn't, you never got any sort of compliment, and you know your state of mind, your state of self, right? And then someone say that you did a good job. I was like, hey, okay lah, at least I have something that I'm good at lah now. <laughs> so I offered to do more things, ah, uh, just to you know to keep doing more good jobs, more good jobs, more good jobs. You know, like try to get the points, brownie points, brownie points over. You know after one another yeah and so that's far how so it really started lah ha huh? so far so good so far so far ada 13 brownie <laughs> point lah 13 tahun kan <laughs> 13 tahun eh yeah. Already, yeah but i think i i think what what i really what i really want to say is that i didn't come in because i know about environment because i was studying it because i was conscious no nothing at all i was desperate yeah I was desperate for a second chance. I was desperate. Uh, I was like, "Hey, kalau aku tak ada kerja, I would probably ha- get a girlfriend. I would get married. I would have family. You know, like I-, I would have the life that I thought I would have. You know, so it give me a second chance. Ah, uh. so that's why I think now I, you know, like in our talent and development program, we always want to 
give opportunity to young people even though they are probably not the best ke, or maybe they're from a different sort of segment of society ke, kan? Yeah. because I do believe in I'm a, I truly believe in second chance uh, because I've got my second chance many times well I'm yeah. I'm glad that Eco Nights is doing something at the ground level that's what I believe is very important to, to achieve sustainability we need to work with the people on the ground with the communities and recently i was talking to uh <clears throat> yasmin about focusing on the urban communities because the urban consumption the consumption of the urban communities is really affecting the environment whether we realize it or not if we can focus this urban mm. community the urban situation i think we can achieve a lot of change in in uh, towards towards we can achieve a sustainable development There you go, Naps. And ask you for your opinions. Uh. I know, Naps, sorry, Naps, I have to cut you because I've been thinking about this about, I think, two it's days. for five years. Well, <laughs> for the past two days. Uh, you know, like, I, 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 re- I realize that somehow in my point of view, in my personal capacity, there's always two things that I look into. Lah. One is from the ideological point of view another one is you know like some people want to take the practicality like if i uh, recycle um i get money you know like practical or, or, or convenient for them but i also feel like this thing that i learn about sustainability is the ideological point of view uh, you know like like why something happens a certain way and what are the things you can and you cannot change you know things like that like got me very very interested uh, to 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 stay and do what i do uh. that's what i think i don't know about you guys maybe you have a different opinion about that okay <laughs> deep state deep state eh? but actually Fadi, how do you how do you, you know convince macam si rv to to form because i think back I, I don't know whether, I'm not sure whether sustainability was as popular as how it is, as important as how it is now. Sustainability was not popular then, but CLEF was something very new in 2008. Mm. Uh, I, we, I was surprised we pulled it off that well. We had, was it XFresh as our radio partner? We had a deputy yeah. minister come for the award ceremony. Uh, I mean, it was so indie style as well, done with very little money yeah. and a lot of fla- favors and a lot of connections, and it got pulled off. Uh, my 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 whole concept was let's just pull it off. I remember sitting at you know, 11 o'clock at night after the kids are asleep, coloring and drawing the map layout, like you know. Oh, wow you know doing all mm. that like yeah yeah, the map yeah. and and at that time you know there was only one two people doing the website and i'm one of them you know <laughs> yeah. yeah so memang For, kena buat yeah. semua kena buat semua and i was like ah tak ada hal lah buat semua because My, i have clarity you know what i want to do finally yeah but for me for me because You know, when I was working with that, uh, you know, with my cousin and we were doing a different sort of business development project, not related to environment. And at the same time, I met Yasmin because uh, we share the same office, kan? And at that point, I was like younger, so, macam, for example, macam any of the intern or new person coming to Econite now. And then you see like eight or nine or ten people who've been working there for three, four, five years, ten years, right? So you're the youngest. And I see the level of work, or the level of um, depth, the level of confidence, speed of what they do. And I was pressured lah to to perform something up to a certain standard, not their standard, but definitely up to a certain standard that is acceptable. Hmm. And uh, nobody doing or observe through whatever whoever people kena marah like the boss marah cakap oh, oh, oh ni 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 and 
you know, oh jangan buat macam ni kan macam you, you because I'm the youngest kan how do I connect to people yang dah 20, 10 tahun kan so <laughs> macam uh, ada inferior lah tu you cerita pasal I, you, you ask me how I got to ZRV and these people kan yeah and these people kan <laughs> this yeah. you know what I I first of all I I sent an email lah. I contacted them. I spoke to them. I explained what I need. I I just I being honest and in secondly is you know what? In my semua early twenties, I was into all this music movement and you know, pergi rock show macam macam lah. You know, I thought I wanted to be a rock star juga lah kan. So the closest thing, but I know I wasn't talented. So the only the closest thing that i can get to become a rock star is to become friends with rock star you know so yeah really so because of that eh, because of that i get to hang out with uh muki from one bug shot i went to his show minum lepak dengan dia lepas after show pergi backstage and then masa tu arwah jeremy little was still alive i i, I went to a festival with him like pergi brief dengan dia and then you know like Uh, you know, like I, I felt like, eh, aku pun part of rockstar, kan? Macam, so aku pun gang dengan rockstar, kau pergi club, oh, macam jumpa groupie. dia orang. Bukan, ah, grup, bukan groupie tau. Groupie is like, ooh, you know, ni macam you gang ah, You know, dia macam, eh, Fadi Fadi, jom lepak dengan kita lah, macam tu lah. Ah, atas sikit lah. Ah, atas sikit lah. Macam, <laughs> macam kru lah. Macam, macam kru lah kan. Macam gang yang macam ada eh, yang you boleh minum. Wait, you you boleh lah. message dia, dia jawab lah. Ah, and I went to their ah, house eh, sometimes eh. Faham, faham, faham. So, faham. so, so what I mean is that, uh, miss, miss, that of course that is that motivation, right? But, but, uh, but yeah. underlying to me, the underlying is, I love building trust. I love building connection with people. I like when I text them and they say I, I, I read, I, I, I analyze, I think like what would be the best response to, you know, I was practicing public relations ah, secara tak langsung sebenarnya. Like, how do I ask some, someone to do something for free? Takkan kau nak cakap, eh, I tak ada duit lah. You nak buat for free tak? Takkan bolehnya. You mesti macam, yeah. you have to say the right way. You have to, you have to be able to negotiate so that they they get it and they are willing, you know. Ah, So, macam, benda tu yang I belajar. Bila I buat macam, oh, okay, this is probably how you speak to these people. And then, of course, through Yasmin's punya... Uh, mentorship, you know, I start to go and meet corporate and then you learn different way of how you connect with corporate and then dengan amli, dengan community lagi ya kan, macam oh community macam ni, macam ni, so when I, I was really learning along the way on how these people do their thing in a different atmosphere, different environment, different situation and I learned how to compartmentalize all this and use it when I need to at the right point at the right time you know uh, that's what i that's what i've been learning uh, and i'm continuing to learn uh, that way yeah i think that's that's really i think more to me is really internal uh, i'm like because i don't don't like people to teach me uh. i don't like people to tell me Fadli, kau kena ni, ni. I, i hate it that's why i drop out of college i i don't like people telling me what to do but because Sorry, I know, <laughs> yes Yeah, I don't like people telling me what to do. But because I know that I have this ego, so the only way for for me to know is I need to find it myself. Otherwise, I'll be stupid, I'll be ignorant, I'll be arrogant, right? So I was like, okay, aku tak suka orang tegur aku buat ni. So aku kena fikir sendiri cara macam mana aku nak buat benda ni supaya orang tak tegur. Macam tu lah. Right. So that's sort of my my motivation to always learn something. Ah, I I want to do it myself so that I don't kena tegur, kena suruh-suruh. I don't like people to like tell me what to do. I've been living that life for 17 years in boarding school apa semua. Semua orang suruh tu, suruh ni, suruh ni macam ah uh, tak boleh lah. I'm like no more. No one's telling me what to do. I'll do it myself. I'll find a way. Yeah, that's me lah. Yeah, alright. Uh, okay, uh, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit because uh, there's a comment that says that you should have a Q&A session from the audience which yes, we, we ah. do welcome questions from the audience. Ada so if soalan have, ke? Uh, wow. Do, Yay. Belum, 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 belum lagi, belum lagi. Ada, ada, ah, okay. ada okay. seorang uh, an audience that suggested. So we will have a Q&A yeah, session. Yeah, drop, drop us a comment on the FB live and we'll take your questions. 
Yep, <coughs> because uh, yeah, you can ask any questions uh, about their journey, girl. If you're curious about anything about Amli, uh, Yasmin, and Fadi, so we will ask this question from time to time and also towards the end of the session. Lah. So we are already like into the forty-six minute already of the session. Uh, and let's get back to talking. So Tadi, I think we can also do one more session because what Fadi mentioned about art of negotiation. I feel that three of you from your journey, you all have all sorts of tips about negotiation. I think for macam Amle, macam mana nak communicate and nego dengan committees, pelbagai committee, pelbagai ragam. And then for uh, Yasmin, all sorts of stakeholders that you've met, governmental, uh, corporate, mm. So that's yeah, Fadi, that's topic. Right? Yeah, yeah, so we should do a topic on that, all right? Uh, yeah. If anyone who has any topic that you want us to talk about, you can also leave in the comment box below and we shall, you know, analyze, reassess all those topics and we can do another session after that, all right? Yeah. Okay, uh, so for three of you, um, what is actually like the best moment that you had throughout your journey when you feel it's worth like, all this hard work, you, know, you feel that even though that's just a fire, but when you see some result or any changes or any impact, you feel that this is the journey for me for now. Wow, that's deep. Wow. Deep, yeah. Deep, deep state, man. <laughs> deep state. Deep state. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I should be the first to say it because I would definitely let the... That was a long question, Nap, so I'm, I'm going to break I'm it happy. down. Yeah, I'm okay. happy when people that I work with, especially the communities, can make their own decision based on the project or the process that we had, we had get them to be involved in. For example, when I was working on a project Penchala, uh, I, I had a good mentor who was uh, Professor Halim Sulaiman from the UM. And he is very, he was a very good communicator. He talked to the people and I sort of learned a lot of from, 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 him, from him. He's not only a, a water expert, but also a very good communicator. So when we talked with the locals, we realized that we cannot tell them what to do. We can discuss with them and ask them what can they do in order to help improve the water quality of Sungai Penchala. They were scholars. And, and squatters during that point of time have been blamed a lot for the water pollution of, uh, in this case, Sungai Pinchala. And they said that if they want to, uh, if, if they were to reduce their, uh, uh, their throwing of rubbish into the river, then they need to be able to have an access to a better waste management facility for example uh, rubbish beans uh, and whatnot at that time mbpj was not supposed or the majlis perbandaran petaling jaya the local authority under which the community uh, was uh, under uh, was not local the local authority was not supposed to provide waste disposal facilities to squatters unless they have money from outside sources and the department of irrigation and drainage under the directorship of uh tansri sharizaila they will provide the money to provide the rubbish bins for the people through the local authority and the local authority said yes we can use that money and provide the waste bins and when the uh, when they provide the waste the rubbish bins or bins on wheels for the communities the next day there were no rubbish at all in the rivers because the communities have made full use of the rubbish bins provided by the department of irrigation and drainage which wow. strengthens my belief that if we can consult the people get them to be involved in decision making not telling them what to do they can do much better than we expect this is why i believe that it can achieve a lot if we carry out the right process with the communities and it is i believe going uh, along the right to the right direction uh, 
uh, we may need some improvements. We need we need uh, improvements like on how to communicate with people, and I think we we are already in in that uh, in uh, in that direction. And with the Kenong community, Kenong project, the forest project, the people have made their decision. The people were at first was not very happy with the project because they believe that uh, we came in to protect the elephants when the elephants had caused them a lot of problem. But we managed to tell them that we are not here just to protect the elephants. We want to make sure that the people gain benefits from ecotourism and at the end of the day, they will see the importance of protecting the forest, including the elephants. After a long discussion, it took a long time to talk to the people, gain their trust, discuss, provide solutions and options. And finally, they come up with their own solutions uh, in terms of ecotourism. They, they uh, uh, suggested a few actions, a few recommendations, which we at that point managed to fulfill some of them. And they, they got involved uh, in a very satisfactory manner. And I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah, wow. I, I can actually, I can resonate with that as well. Because uh, I like, like Amelie also was involved in community work. And then, you know, when I see someone, even if it's just an individual from community, they learn something, there's positive changes. I feel happy. Yes. Mm. Yeah. You should. What about yeah. <laughs> oh my Yasmin, what's your best moment? Well, I think one of the best moments in this journey thus far is when I knew it was time to let go of the direction of Eco Nights to you guys. Um, I see the work that we do as continuous until majority of the communities we work with uh, are able to self-sustain their own development sustainably. But I think the, the, the biggest and the most impactful one would be seeing the growth of the organization, uh, seeing the growth of its people um, and finally coming to the decision that I, I can, I think I've done the most. I mean, I, if you asked me this 20 years ago, was I thinking of setting up an organization? Like, no, that was totally, this is not in my plans at all. But along the way, I've met amazing people like you guys. I, I think, I like to think that with or as an organization, we've provided employment opportunities. We embrace diversity among ourselves. And despite that, mo most of the time, we understand the work that we do. And we work our ass off and to the best of everyone's capabilities to achieve what our vision and mission is set out to do. So I, I, I think Econites belongs to the young, like you guys. And I'm actually trying to take a seat back to see how we all fare uh, along the way. So uh, you guys got a, still quite a lot of bit to do in the organization, but that's life. Not like you're always... But I, but I think what I love about what I see in front of me, what has been created is a family, a family. Um, and, you know, if you've been in our organizations or like simple things like how we run our internship programs, how we support people that are disadvantaged out there, get them employed, get them trained give them the opportunities to learn something new. So if anything at all, if the environment is not getting better as fast as we like it to be, 
I hope Econites has done its mission by growing the kind of capable leaders we want this generation to have. Um, that's 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 the, the most I think I can achieve in my lifetime. The rest is really all up to you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's touching up. <laughs> you cry now. Yes, I cry. Ada ada sikit sikit kat sini dah. Sikit ada sikit je. <laughs> okay. Alright, uh, I want to move on to Fadli, but we actually had a question lah, macam uh, Eh, hey, layan my question, Satu. Ah, uh, uh, Shura ada tak? Shura dengan Nisa. Alright. So, uh, I go to Rita's question. Uh, these two questions are quite the same. One from Niza Muhammad Shahari, and the other one hmm. from Shura. Those two are quite the same. What are the challenges? Apa soalan dia? Uh, from okay, Niza the first Muhammad one. So, Niza and Shura, we... Yeah, uh, next. Baca next. I baca. I baca. Oh, I baca. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Uh, so Niza is asking, uh, what is the toughest problem in building community in sustainability, which is also similar to Shura's question, yes. uh, challenge in implementing uh, community sustainability in Malaysia. So we can actually actually answer both their questions at one time. Toughest problem in building community in sustainability. What is it? In your opinion. Building your... trust. Building trust. I think that's the part where, uh, for me lah, sorry I jump in, but mm -hmm. about communities have their own uh, perspectives, experiences, heritage, culture, tradition of certain things. And I think when you walk into a community, your intention sometimes is always, of course, to want to do something good. Bukan you not harm community, kan? But um, sometimes as an outsider, we fail, um, you know, especially if you're well knowledgeable, uh, you know, you're whatever technical person, you think you, you, know what needs, you, you know what needs to be done. But it's how to get there that is the most critical to address. And different communities react differently to different people. And I've seen certain communities turn away from help. Or, and I've seen communities yang macam, you know, when I was doing my research, I datang tanya soalan, and then I realized halfway through, like, the stories sound very similar from one home to another. And then I wanted to find out why, and I, I learned that one of the ladies was like, you, you people come in here and ask us questions, and you go, and then you do your studies, and you go present, and then you come here. At the end of the day, our lives don't change. You satisfy whatever you want to do, but our lives don't change. So... Um, and you don't even tell us what you're studying sometimes, you know, you just get data and you go off. So I, I think that, that that's an important mm. thing to look at really um, to be with the community, to be with the community, to re yeah. resonate with their needs and wants. And I think trust is very important. Um, and then walking in with humility is very important. Uh, no matter how many degrees you have on you or how many decades of experience walking into community you need to know where your place is um and for me being a malay muslim that don't really some you know when i we work in rural communities and i don't look that part where you know a typical woman should look like i i respect that uh, and i back off you know i mean that's the, another thing versatility you need to be versatile and realize that if you've got a project to run how to find the right people to be the frontliners for these projects. Um, yeah. But those are the three things I can think of. Amle, maybe you can add more. I know the challenge for me, I see external challenges, i.e. challenges from the communities as something that I want to face. That is what I'm here for. I want to face the challenges from the communities because it will build my strength. But the challenge is, challenge for me is, internal can i work with them can i stand that challenge i want if if i mean if everything is so smooth <laughs> it's not going to be that exciting you see <laughs> you want some some opposition how do you work with this community how do you work with the for example the seleta people are they going to see you as a malay who has ignored them for a long time this is how i'm going to work with them i want to to show them that I am one guy whom you can trust. That is a challenge. 
not challenge from them. You will always face challenges from people. And that is why you want to work. If we cannot face challenges, then I think, like Yasmin said, better work in the lab. Okay, that's, and still <laughs> working in the lab, you are going to face challenges, you see? But I think people who are interested in doing sustainability need to improve one thing, and that is communication. How do you go into the forest and talk to the people who, who do not trust the urbanites and they are very, very, uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, what's the word? Eh? They, yeah, they don't trust suspicious. people. Yes, suspicious. They, and they, how, they question your intention. Yes. And how do you jump that? How do you avoid that obstacle? That is the challenge I want to see. And, and I think... Uh, uh, the other challenge is how do you improve your, once you get the trust, how do you improve that process of decision making? How do you make it more efficient so that the people mm -hmm. will be able to make decision better? I'm not there to tell them what to do. I'm going to give you a few things, few facts, Tools. pluses and minuses of this, the pros and cons. Now, you have all this information you make that decision. And I'm sure if we do this rightly, the people will make the best, best decision for the survival of their generation. And that is sustainable development. Sustainable development is the kind of development that you, re that you reach after you have undergone that process of informed decision making. You cannot put any criteria or quantitative criteria on sustainable development. That's why we're having problem. What is sustainable development? For me, it's easy. Sustainable development is about the people making what is the best for them and the future generations. I'm not there to tell them this is good for you. This is good for your grandchildren. You decide. Once they have achieved that, that decision, that is sustainability. That's my understanding. If you're wow. going to put that here, it's going to be very difficult. Well said. Wow. Well, I'm going to quote yeah, you on that only. Philosophical, wow. yeah, <laughs> society about the humans. That's that's actually very important. A lot of people, you know, forget about the human part. Everybody's just chasing after quantity, quantity, but not really quality, which actually is very human centric. Yeah, people yeah, can. Yeah, I think it, like I told you before during the funk, the uh, the funky funky talk, right? Funky talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you both, you both looked at each other on the screen at the same time. That is so weird. It's as if you're next to each other. That is so weird. Next, I, I, no, I'm saying I'm late. I'm late. Enough, I'm late. You guys Enough. like, yeah. Weird. <laughs> no, nobody oh, wants again, people, late. Uh, Nobody wants people to come to the, to the Eco Night office and tell the people, Okay, next, you should sit there. Uh, more, you should sit there. This is what it should be without knowing, without asking the people in Ikunites what is the best for them. Same with people, same with you going to one community or people coming to the, your community, no matter whether he has a PhD or three PhD or Nobel Prize winner, you don't want him to come to your place and tell you, okay, this is what the community could do without even taking okay. the step or call consultation, okay? Hmm. This is what it can should do. Talk to people. people okay. uh, to the people. Fadli, Fadli nak cakap this dah. Is, this okay. is, I, I may have a, I, I may have a, I may have a, an, an unpopular opinion, maybe a little bit radical. I think this thing about sustainable development is a, is a selfish definition created by capitalists, you know, to justify what they do as being necessary, as a necessity. And then label people who are perhaps not up to their standard as being backwards. Therefore, they are not sustainable. You know, because you talk about sustainable development, sustainability community is all about oh, why com this community has trash. This community that cannot cannot keep up with their life livelihood. Their their heritage is lost. Think about it. All as, all of those happen is because of capitalism. You know, because of unsustainable development that is created by these greedy people, right? So, 
so when we go to them, my, my, I think my problem is when we go to them and tell them that, oh, this is how you should live sustainably, they would tell us that, no, this is how we have been living sustainably for thousands of years. Suddenly, our level of sustainability is not up to your standard. You know, because we have too much plastic, because you created them. You created them, make it convenient for us, we use it, and then suddenly we cannot manage it, and you tell us that we are not sustainable. But the problem was created by these corporations or big companies, you know, people who create products, and eventually it came to these communities, eventually it affects the community, if eventually the, there's no more fish in the sea for them to catch. And then you come and tell them that, oh, this is how you should live sustainably. You have to create this new method of growing fish, ke, rearing fish, ke, apa ke. but the fact that the problem happened because of you, the big corporation, or government, or you know people who took advantage of the natural resources, you know as much as they can for thousands of years, hundreds of years, and then suddenly you go to these communities and say that we want to teach you about sustainable living. I feel like it's really oxymoronic. It's, it, well, it's to be fair, to be fair, you know? to be fair say, Fat, yeah? Fadli, to be hmm. fair, Fadli, what corporations do also create jobs and improve livelihoods of certain people. I think... I, I a, agree it, with that. Yeah, so, and, and in general, the world has pr progressed uh, very well. There's half less people in, living in poverty today than 20 years ago. Uh, there are more people getting more access to health care today than before. In general, the world is progressing well for the benefit of more people. But I think what the million dollar question is, when is enough? When uh, is, when our, is, is it when our resources completely deplete and things collapse? Or yeah. are we able to today do something habitually, change certain things about business operations, um, burn a, less, a lot less gas, find more alternatives so that we can share the bigger cake with more people over a longer time. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, I, I, I totally agree because obviously we are part of, you know, the progress that, you know, we have achieved so far. But what, what I'm trying to say is that I think the clash is that to them, this is sustainable to their point of view. So now this is a clash of ideology, right? Like to them, sustainable living is you just use what you need and certain things like that and then suddenly we introduce all these things because you know the the you know the revolution or industrial revolution and everything make accessible so i think it's really tough when amli say and i agree with amli i agree with you you know when we go to them and we tell them what to do to them it's like this is really confusing it's very confusing because they don't see anything wrong with the way they live. They were affected because of the unsustainable development that happened by this corporation because they, mm. because they didn't think about it when they started it 100 years ago, 150 years ago during the Industrial Revolution when they found oil and whatnot, you know. People just mm. consume for 150 but, years. These people yeah. have used all it. Suddenly, now we are at the brink of time. No, you so raise a very important like the, point. Yeah. yeah, you raise a very important yeah, so point I mean. because, so, yeah. Yeah. So well, so so I, I just had to finish it. So what I mean, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, I I'm not saying that it's bad. To me, I'm I have to look at a different perspective. You know, because we work yeah. with corporates. I can't say that we work with corporate. Therefore, like corporate are bad people. No, we work with them because we want to educate them and all that. But I think that 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 gap there is the most crucial. Like I think no one has the right answer now to really find well, that right approach. Right? These these corporations are going if they want to be in existence for the next fifty years are going to have shareholders that are going to get younger and younger as well. Uh, and these shareholders are people like you and me. Uh, for all you know, the bank that you're banking with, or the savings and all that, is probably investing into these big corporations. Um, it's important to find out as well if we are part of the problem. And number two, if you talk about products out there that are created out of a convenience, it really points down to consumerism. We want these things. We 
buy these things in big quantities. And we want it disposable. We want it convenient. That drives and shapes how products are made and in what quantity. We want to drink more milk. We want more cheese. We want to eat more imported meat now because we can't afford to. So we are all driving this uh, ourselves. And it's really ridiculous to say you got to stop driving and take a public transportation to be a tree hugger and all that. Yeah. I mean, that movement is already strong. You need that movement around as well because someone's got to put pressure. Um, but if you really, really rethink really about it, if all of us are conscious about what we consume, we can shape the new economy of the future. And I call this economy, not an, an economy in a tradition, traditional sense. Imagine eco ecological economy, an economy that respects mm. products, that tells you lifespan of a product, that teaches you how to reuse these products, and that creates, generates higher value for waste because they're precious for some other reasons. I think that is the paradigm and dimensional whatever shift we need to make. Uh, but that's we what, need to catch up. Community projects are very important because you're going right down to the people who can yeah. make changes. Because if you don't want and, to recycle because yeah. it's a freaking pain, then refuse. Oh, not a mara, yeah. You I, know, people's like, oh, recycle, <laughs> recycle. I was like, dude, sebelum recycle, you boleh tak tengan ambil benda yang ada plastik. Kalau tak ada benda ni kat rumah, tak payahlah nak fikir recycle. Betul tak? The first yeah. R, actually. And, and, yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, and and I like I, I the, the questions about how to the, the previously kind of about how to uh, uh the, the biggest challenge in uh, community sustainability or development is I think people yeah I think it's also because people uh, or people who invest in it in the sense of monetary ke branding ke kan, they always uh, to me uh, based on my experience so far after ten fifteen years is that a lot of them are looking for a short-term gain. Mm, you know, it's yeah. like you do one year, two years, and then you expect that, oh, the community, there's an impact. And impact is a huge word, you know. Impact is like something that is sustainable. And sometimes people invest to do one project this year and they expect it to have an impact and to be sustainable. You know, we've done our work in Econites for 15 years, right? And you know how yeah. tough it is to sustain Claire for 13 years, you know? You know, it's and then after ten years, then only some people recognize, and then you, you know, it's, sometimes it takes over ten years to sort of ha see that actual impact. When you see the people who volunteered that time now become a speaker or activist in the different organization, now they also run their projects and in class. You know, like after ten over years, it's the long term investment, and I don't think many corporations, especially people with uh, resources are willing to spend. That's why some some big foundations like the Bill Gates Foundation again, and they spend on a certain things so a huge amount of money for a, a 10, 20 years or a project because it takes that long to see some real change. So our challenge is always people come in and pump in a certain amount of resources and then expect some outcome or output which is like numbers of people who attend, blah, blah, blah. And then they expect that, oh, after this, this thing, this project will run by itself. It's really, really hard, man. This is what I think from my operation point of view. Lah. So I think the challenge is how do you get people or, 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 or people with resources, people who are willing to know that if they are going to do this, you're going to invest a lot of years and effort to see something change. This is what I, um, is I'm going to jump in and cut Fadli that. off. Um, let's yeah. uh, address Ruyi's question, Te Ruyi. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for your comment. Uh, I really like that comment and I think I'm biased because that's exactly um, my methodology of choice when for my PhD, which is to use a participatory action research approach uh, to actually look at how interventions go in community. And um, Appreciate it. It's really a hard method in Malaysia because a lot of people don't see it as a scientific method, uh, which is why I studied it to like kick their ass and tell them that it's a scientific method. 
and to tell them that you don't need scientific i mean like how scientific can you get sometimes as communities you got to put a bit of heart and soul into research you got to blur that line between a research and a member of community i mean if, if this mm. is also like design thinking when you actually want to come up with solutions you really got to go through the entire process of really are they mm. having a problem like what you think they're having a problem do they see it as a problem do you do they empathize with that problem and whatever solution that they're going to co-create with you where are you able to validate that this is a solution that they need and do they have the right resources to maintain that solution so it's it's mm. a multitude of things for community development. Yeah. Yes, you can put it in a framework, but a framework means shit. If you take it out there and you think you can control how the framework works, because you don't, dude, you don't control the community's mind. Yeah. You don't know how it is over there. You've yeah. got to really give it a bit of human touch. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, we're all quite similar, quite same. Maybe we all have different. Uh, academic background or, or different economic background, but essentially you bear strip us down to basic human emotions, fear, needs, wants. It's there. It's just yeah, a different and, hierarchy. You know your favorite hierarchy for the, the Maslow hierarchy of yeah, needs. Yeah, <laughs> and also Yasmin, I like what you mentioned about the multi-tier. You know, I think it's not only multi-tier, but I think another challenge is. Um, interdisciplinary partnership, you know, mm, because sustainable yeah. development can't be solved by uh, environmentalists or science people. You know, you need economics, you need economies. Yes, sustainable you need, you development need cannot be solved by NGOs. You cannot need be solved by communicators. Only. You need you need all sorts of people from different sort of background, like really, you know, arts, yeah. creative, film, all these things. Like really, it, it's a it's a it's a complex ecosystem. And what I like about again one of the our uh, you know our most um, I think important uh, talent and leadership development right when we inv when we get intern interns coming you know from different backgrounds not necessarily from science or, or environment or biodiversity you know we get from even um, dentistry medicine engineering uh, in language uh, and you name it right because to us to me. Or and to us as the you know as the the, the head of the econet is like how much more of what we don't know can be put in to be you know to be considered because we always look into our lens right or oh, I'm environmentalist is all the problem is always um, uh, pollution you know but people from communication would think differently people from different background would think differently so I think that's what makes econet. To me, for 13 years, and I love going to the office every day because every day I get to listen to something that I don't know, and it gives me all this hope that oh, okay, if we merge this and this, this and this, this and this, I think we can come up with something new. We always come, we can come up with something, and we did over the years. So that's what I think one of the biggest challenges is to try and involve as many interdisciplinary people to come in and solve that sort of problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe I believe that when we're working towards sustainability, there is no what we call a specific goal except to carry out the process. I think we have heard this before. The success is not the destination, but the journey. Once we take that journey, that process, I believe we have already succeeded. Whatever turns at the end of the day, we cannot we cannot predict or we cannot just we, we cannot fix what but what we can fix is the process once you've taken that process in the right manner the consultation the participatory process and the informed decision making with the stakeholders i believe that we we can say that we are successful even though at the end of the day we might have we might have a different kind of uh, goal that the communities may have but i'm happy if i go to a community then even though deep in my heart i have something else that i want the community to, to do but based on the process the participatory process or the consultation process that we had carried out with the community they came up with something else i am happy already because that is for me sustainability 
very sustainable development. Mm. When I was working with Project Penchala or the Selata people, I never expected that they would come up with that kind of, of, of uh, solutions. I never thought of that. And once they came up with those solutions that some of us may not have thought of, we should feel happy because we've carried out that, pro that process. There was a question about Iskandar Putri. I was working with Iskandar Putri about a uh, yeah. few years back. Sapuan. Sapuan. <laughs> Sorry? Sapuan. Hi, Sapuan. Oh, so, Sapuan. Sapuan. Uh, Hi, Shura. I think when you talk about Iskandar Putri, most probably you're talking about the, <laughs> the public and corporate sectors there because I see that there's a lot of uh, public and corporate agencies and those are the stakeholders. They should make the decision of what's going to happen. But at the same time, there are also some other communities there. For example, maybe uh, indirectly or directly, the Selata people at Sungai Temun, they, they are affected by the Iskandar Putri development there. Uh, maybe they should be one of the stakeholders whom you sh whom we should consult and oh uh, opinions from hmm. there's another one from all right testing Amli. Sorry, can you hear uh you testing testing okay so yeah. I'm Oh, okay. Okay, question. Oh, we have two questions, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, the, this, the first one by Shura that addressed with Niza's question. So, mm -hmm. because it's going to be 11.30 soon, and I think this hope semua orang kena kerja kan walaupun work from home. <laughs> we should so, wrap up. Yeah, we should wrap up with uh, Shura's uh, one more question, which is, I think, is very important for us to, to address also, which is uh, Malaysia Sustainability Education Development. What is your view on that? Malaysia Sustainability Education Development. Is that a policy? What is that? Is that a government policy? I don't Malaysia know. Malaysia Sustainability Education Development. Tapi dia tak, tak ni kan. It wasn't really announced much. But I mean, yeah. what is my view? Mm. I think we need one. But if there is one, maybe you can share as a link. Uh, sustainability Education. That's what we're all trying to do. How about Amri? Uh, what do you think about? Oh, sorry, Yasmin, you want to say something? No, no, I have no comments for this. Amri? Uh, which which question is that again? I missed that one. Uh, the one that is on on our screen, Sarah. What is your view on the Malaysia sustainability education development? Oh, that is a tough question because I see sustainability as an integrated approach towards achieving sustainable development. Is is integ integrated? Thing. There is no such thing as education. There is specific for sustainability. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you should learn about sustainability right. in every field. It's not yes, like sustainability correct. is not a field, but it's yes. in everything that is important in our life. Yes. Even if you're but, learning business, engineering, it should be all embedded across. Correct. It's a cross-sectoral thing. Mm. But when you want to carry out that project, you need somebody, I mean, at the ground level, huh? you need somebody who understands sustainability and the concept or the philosophy of integrated approach. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> And I'm glad, I'm glad. Thank you, Shura. Thank you, Shura. And, and I'm, I'm glad that some agencies, for example, the Plan Malaysia and also the Department of Education and Drainage have taken the steps towards using this concept or adapting, adopting this concept in their projects. For example, the Department of Irrigation and Drainage, they have the integrated river basin management projects where they combine the the, 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 uh, the hydrologists the mm. sociologists the education is to be together and come up with a solution to achieve certain goal on the river water quality and quantity so there is there is a greater awareness and understanding towards that direction 
of sustainable development. Mm. Mm. I, I, my my opinion is that I I I hold on to this one sort of one of my many like taglines or motto that I I keep on principle that I I I always try to you know to apply in my life is that. Uh, and I always tell my team is that we are not here to be right, you know. We but we are here to make it right. So I think the challenge with education, you know, accessibility education in Malaysia or even sustainable development or community is, I think, uh, to put aside differences. And of course, everybody is expert, you know, in different fields. But then I think the basic challenge is to put up differences instead of. You know, like oh, I'm right because this is my idea. I it's not that, but it's more about making it right. So that I think that is that part where you know to get people to or all these people stakeholders to agree on something that have put aside all their egos and all their whatever agenda, personal agenda. Because I think. That is the way forward for me personally, and I think we, I, I personally would you know apply in the team because you know even imagine like if intern comes in and give ideas and then someone who is more senior and say that, oh you know your idea is too childish whatever you know it it doesn't help because it's not about that it's about listening to it, and try our best to, to to analyze and find the best method. Without any personal favor to anyone, lah. So that's my opinion, and I agree about making all of this. You know, inter you know, sustainability is like interdisciplinary. It's like, it's like if you have finished your class, you know, in school, you finish your class from morning until afternoon. I think the last subject should be how to relate all this to sustainability. You know, yeah. like it's almost like yeah. a reflection class. You know, it's just like okay, you learn math, you learn physics, you learn this. How do you think this is related to how we live our world, right? And then people will just say that, oh, now I understand that certain things like this, and this is the impact. Doesn't have to be a formal education. It's just to make sure whatever people do in whatever they learn and do, there is some sort of sustainability in you know in the fundamental of it, lah. That's what I think. So you know. So that's what I think about education. It doesn't have to be formal, but it has to be meaningful for people to 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 be con feel connected to 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 the world or to the nature. Hmm. All right. Okay. We, um, we, need, we need another session on this 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 issue. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> like two session, two extra topics for us now. <laughs> Yeah. We can Some, we can do it every night if and if we can do it every night if someone wants to listen lah or we can just talk without <laughs> anyone listening you know like I don't mind yeah. I used to listen I know you don't guys, mind you know a couple of hours every day right it's just I like just, let's just talk right? for two hours every night yeah <laughs> and find different people to share different opinions yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay all right so actually there are like I think one or two more questions I don't think we are unable uh, we are able to address them but don't worry because these questions are recorded in our chat so we'll share these questions with uh, Yasmin, Amle and Fadi and perhaps we can reply to your questions maybe tomorrow or something like that I hope yeah, you guys we'll reply on FB yeah we we'll reply on FB mm -hmm. and um at this yeah so if anyone has any suggestions on what topics you all want us to talk about, uh, leave in the comment box below. Kalau you shy na bagi suggestion pun, boleh uh, DM kita lah. Alright, PM us. Uh, let us know what you want us to talk about. We'll be glad to just sembang je. Alright, simple je. Okay, um, so it's already 11.31. Uh, I think I pun dah nak tidur je. <laughs> Besok yeah, kerja. I pun nak tidur. Besok kerja <laughs> lah. Yeah, Next, okay. we're delayed by two, yeah. well, one hour. Eh. It's a little bit of a time. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 30 minutes. Okay, Amli, your turn. <laughs> okay, I would like to thank everybody who sent who, who sends in the question. And because the question or the questions are very challenging. I, I like mm. challenging questions because it will refine our position, our direction. Once we have these kind of questions, we will be able to, to get it better. Oh, writer. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> thank right, you, Nap and yeah. everyone. Yeah, my last thank word you. would be, my last word would be anyone who is watching, 
Ya, yeah, siapa-siapa yang dah tengok uh, If you find this insightful If you have the next session, we have the posters Please invite <laughs> more people to listen lah Because kita nak uh. kita nak make sure lagi ramai orang berkongsi idea so Ya, yeah, tapi bagus can... idea Niza tu Dia kata uh, korang buat every night tak apalah Tapi janganlah buat malam Jumaat Weh, ada orang ada plan lain <laughs> <laughs> Itulah malam Jumaat aku nak baca Yasin dua busy. kali. Niza ha, Niza busy sikit ah. Baca, 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 baca Yasin. Hmm itulah. Okey, aku dah Niza. Malam malam pun busy. Ah, aku kali <laughs> malam malam busy. Cewa. <laughs> Okey. <laughs> Okey, pergilah busy sekarang. Right, thank you so much. Miss you guys. Good night. Bye. Thank Good night. you for the first pilot show. Bye. Right, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Alamak, alamak tu tu ni. Cakap tu kan toy pilot. <laughs> Alright, huh? thanks everybody. <laughs> Alright, so thanks everyone. Uh, okay. uh, we've already wrapped up uh, and wishing you all to have a good week. Uh, especially for those who are working from home. Very challenging for all of us. If you have any topics you want to suggest, any questions, uh, you can still leave in our comment box below even though the live has ended. Don't worry about it. You can comment. Tak dapat comment, sila lah pergi DM kita lah. Private messages, alright? So, thanks everybody. Have a good night. Uh, sweet dreams to you. <laughs> okay, thanks Amli. You want to go back already? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.